identity theft is an international business. 7,000 people being held, chained to the floor, zapped with cattle prods, sat at a computer, scamming the world. The CIA wished to develop a system of exchanging information. This is where the birth of the dark web came. If you think of the whole of the internet as a glacier, really, below the ocean, that's the majority. 98% if not more is deep web. So I chose to do it on trafficking of Nigerian females under the influence of witchcraft. So these women transported, trafficked through UK in transit over to mostly Italy. Prior to that, they get taken to a shrine. The Juju priest invokes the spirits. The ladies, when they get out, they have to swear an oath that they will not talk to police. They are psychologically and religiously bound to this oath. Would you agree with the, the rise of knife crime? It doesn't really matter what the statistics say. People get scared. It's impacting people's lives. Criminalizing something does not stop it. Do the powers that be want it fixed? Drugs, crime, war, terror, all these things that are infesting our fucking communities. Are we fighting an uphill battle? Are we ever gonna win? Tony, welcome on the show. Thank you very much, Ty. Thanks for having me. I've put the formal voice on now. Oh, wow. Game, I mean, on. Game on. It's like someone's changed. Have you swapped? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I was just looking for this research your team's done. And um, I can't believe how much stuff you've got up to, how much work you've done. So it says here, like Dorset Police for nearly a decade. And within that, you did some covert intelligence officer work. You um, are an independent consultant for governments. You were contracted by the UN, uh, UN Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, international law enforcement advisor and private industry trainer on modern slavery. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Mate, that's not mine. Where do you find that? <laughs> I don't know. That guy sounds cool. Who's that? <laughs> when you hear someone read that back, <laughs> do you think like, I need to do more? Or do you think, cool, I've done quite a lot? Yeah, get off my lazy ass. I, do you know what? It's, it's funny. Like when you sort of listen it, it's almost like chronological order as well. Because I can like remember being back in the cops and doing the covert stuff and then how that, how one led on to the other as well. So mm. it's like, it's like a story of your life being read back to you. It's, it's, quite it's amazing. Mate. But before we delve into it, as with every guest here and we're talking offline, mm. I'd like to take it just back to the childhood years. Because especially with you on the drive here, I was thinking, I want to understand with this guy where this urge has come from or drive has come from to do this work in this space because it's all public public services right oh, yeah. generally speaking like it's yeah and like there's obviously something when you were young you might be not be aware of it or be aware of it or not unpacked it that's given you that drive to try and do good yeah yeah so let's take it right back tell me a little bit about the early years where you were born where you yeah. grew up yeah. life we mentioned this a little bit more before didn't we like the two to sevens mm. that's when it really starts <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> I was, I mean, I'm born Manchester, actually underline, okay. uh, all family in Northern. Mum was Blackpool. She'd prefer St. Anne's, the posh bit, if I was <laughs> going to talk about it. Um, dad was, yeah, Manchester and everyone else. And we came down South. My father had a quite a severe stroke when I would have been about three and a half, four. Couldn't walk top properly. Um, you know, sort of over the years, he managed to hobble and uh, could never really say more than one or two words. How so old my, was he at the time? Sorry, Tony. Yeah, no, that's all right, mate. He was 44. Young yes, as well. he was young for that. So that and irrevocably changed my mother's life as well. Okay. And so when we came down here, the choice was basically my, my half brother, who's a lot older, was stationed in the Marines. And also at the time, and we're going back a while now, uh, Southampton General was one of the best for, um, you know, as a cardiac units, those kind of things, dealing with strokes. So, and this is a story as I understood it. Came down south, moved to Poole. Um, and in so those sort of early years, I, my earliest memories really when it comes to my father is, you know, I can remember, and this sounds dramatic, but it's the reality. I can remember him dying numerous times because of repeated strokes over the years, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I can remember like, you know, flashing lights, ambulances. I can remember that a lot as a kid, not in necessarily a negative way, but it's just something I recall vividly. Um, and I think, and I delved into this over time, you know, as you get older and, uh, and you know, and become more, more self-aware, like, you know, you do time and the people you speak to, 
you sort of want to learn more about why you are the way you are, how you tick, how you see the world, how you see yourself in it, and, and those kind of things. And I did a lot of that. And there was a bit of research there actually showed that, you know, when when you're very young and you're a care of the parent, and I don't mean that in any way, shape, or form to be proportionate to the care that my mother gave my father at all. But when you're in that position where you're almost on par, if not more, of looking after a parent, um, that has a, an impact on you. And I think um, probably, my, I think I, or I feel that I have a, um, a strong empathy for people. Um, uh, I always, you know, try and think how would they want to be treated. I don't want to hurt someone. I don't want to feel bad, those kind of things. Um, and I think that's probably stuck even subconsciously to the point of joining joining the cops. I think it always gave me, you know, when, you know, when you're young and someone goes, what do you want to be when you get older? And a lot of us when we're young, we like, I want to be, I don't know, a pilot. I want to mm. be da, da, da. And I remember getting like a lot of satisfaction and comfort knowing I want to be a cop. And that was it. And it wasn't like to chase a bad guy down the street, you know, and, and all that kind of the sexy side. Mm -hmm. It was, I want to make sure that person's all right. I want to go and get that stuff back for that person who got robbed. You know, that, that kind of stuff. And that, and that really stuck. And I think that probably led the direction of my career within the police as well, of moving to the covert side of things, of being able to, to talk to people, being able to talk to I can use this as a friendly term now, the crooks, being able to talk to the crooks as well as, you know, the other clients, um, you know, and, and victims of crime and things like that. And I think that just inevitable, I think it was an inevitable pathway for me up until mm. that point. I'm smiling because I feel like as soon as you said that bit, I thought, I think I found it. Oh, I think I found it. Well, what I think hmm. you've spent your life or younger years and excuse me if I'm speaking out of turn here, like looking out for the parent a bit when the parent normally would look out for you. So you might have this deep thing inside you where you like to help people because a lot of these jobs are helping people, right? Helping people that are less fortunate, helping people that haven't got a voice for themselves, especially with the children part that we'll get onto later on. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of truth in that, Ty. Yeah. I do, yeah. I think because I recognize that in others that I've worked alongside with as well who tend to go into those sort of services. And again, you know, you've got frontliners in, in uh, ambulance service mm. and, you know, doctors, nurses, et cetera. Um, you know, they, there's a genuine want to help. Um, you'll get the dickheads who join these police, for example, because of other reasons, mm -hmm. okay? But that certainly wasn't the case with the majority I ever dealt with and uh, and worked alongside. And some of the superhumans, you know, who I really consider myself fortunate of to have either crossed paths with working with them for a short period of time or for those that have been, have become lifelong friends, you know? Yeah. The, the circle of trust, the real ones, the real, the good, the good humans, yeah. you know? They're rare, but yeah, there's a few out there, isn't there? That's it, yeah, yeah. I feel like <clears throat> anytime you go through any adversity with someone, a group of people or a friend or a family member or any long-term challenge, it just brings you close, like a lifelong bond, doesn't it? It does, yeah. With some of these people. Yeah, oh, 100%. So how do you, okay, so you've moved down here, you're at school, I presume, doing your normal stuff. Are you then finishing school at GCSE and going straight into the cops? Or are you doing higher education? Are you... Yeah, so I I um I went to a grammar school for until I was about sixteen, mm -hmm. yeah, and then uh, hated it because there was no girls, <laughs> and as we all know, Ty, when we come to those ages, <laughs> you know, we, we start to get other interests, yeah. Um, and I was playing a lot of rugby at the time, and another local school um was doing some really amazing rugby tours. It's so like different countries and stuff. And I, I spoke to the uh, the head of rugby at the time and said, you know, why don't you come over to here for sixth form? So I did. I played a lot of rugby. Mm -hmm. There were some girls there, which was great. My chat was terrible. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that just... Has that changed or not? <laughs> absolutely awful. That's why I'm still single. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the education pathway, I guess, up until there. And then I always wanted to go in the Marines. That was sort of like, I was following my, uh, sort of, uh, half brother, uh, sort of pathway a little bit there. And then 
do you know a funny thing happened? I'm, I'm sort of skipping forward a little bit. But anyway, I went to university, but I wanted to join the Marines as well. So I was the idea was to try and get a, uh, some sort of scholarship there. Um, but I took a gap year. Mm -hmm. I went over to South Africa and I lived there for a year. And I was coaching uh, sport, mostly rugby, um, over there at a, at a school. And this is post-apartheid. But you could see the the um, inequality. It was in your face, certainly, um, even though there were still those exciting days, you know, 10 years after apartheid kind of thing of where all those hopes and dreams of, you know, the um, things getting better mm -hmm. for the majority. Um, it was an amazing time for me, but I could, I was still going to the informal settlements, you know, what we used to call the shanty towns, playing cricket, taking the kids there to play rugby, seeing this whole different vibe of life. And I was just intoxicated by it, absolutely intoxicated. And I can remember just my, this pathway of going Marines or, or armed, armed services just started to, to fade away, mm -hmm. dissipate. And I can remember like within the last month or two of, of that, that that gap year going, do you know what? I don't think this is for me. I don't think I want to go in that route. Um, and I didn't. But then I was like, oh shit, what am I going to do now? Oh, I know. I'll join the police. <laughs> 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 yeah, this is one of those. So I, I mean, I had, a, uh, I was doing some sports coaching. I, I did a sports degree basically to delay my life for three years mm -hmm. and get drunk in Cardiff. Well, um, so you've got a degree then? I did, yeah, I did my bachelor's there. I did my master's later on, which became more relevant to what I do now. Um, yeah, so that that was a sort of, I was sports coaching for a while and then I was like, I can't, it's not for me. Um, and don't get me wrong, amazing, loved loved it with the kids. You know, I've got a strong affinity to, to working with kids in one capacity or another. And um, I love that side of things. But to be fair, I got bored very quickly mm -hmm. and... But it was a, oh, what am I going to do now? Is that something that is quite big in you, getting bored of stuff and moving on quite quick or not? Are you generally all right? Yeah, yeah, you probably, you probably I suffer with that. That's spotted something there. Yeah, I mean, even in my police career, I think, you know, there was a, a maximum of a two-year turnaround probably in role. And even within the those roles of, um, you know, becoming uh, a force administrator on, on, on cybercrime or becoming, you know, the, the lead on modern slavery kind of things. You know, that was, it, even though if it was just equivalent rank, for example, I'd still now have a new role, something to get my, my teeth stuck into. Um, and I have a very deep thirst for knowledge, particularly around people. Mm -hmm. I love talking to people. I want to know everything about them. And that translates also into, well, how can we do this job, policy procedure in the best way that that makes it the best service we can deliver, mm -hmm. okay? And when you've got a topic that I know nothing about, that's it. I mean, I, I love it. I don't want to, it's not that I don't want to advance on, on other things. It's just this is something new, something I personally get satisfaction out of, and it's exciting to me, even if it's a horrendous topic, mm -hmm. a horrendous aspect of crime or whatever it might be i just dive into it and i think that's probably kept my interest in the criminal justice world for as long as it has i mean yeah. we're probably coming up to about 15 16 years now. long time isn't it yeah yeah long time hi guys while i've got you i wanted to announce an exciting new sponsor for the show for those that know me or listen regularly you'll know that i'm a big combat sports fan and some of my favorite kit to use when training is by a brand called venom Fellow combat sports fans will know Venom as the UFC's official outfitting apparel partner. They have clothing and equipment for MMA, boxing, Muay Thai and BJJ. However, what I'm most excited about is their new lifestyle range, some of which I'll be rocking on the show. It's a privilege to partner with a global brand such as Venom. Will it make me a better athlete? Probably not, but at least I'll look good doing it. You're in the police force for nearly a decade, it says here, right? Mm. But when the, the listeners listening to this or the public think of police, they just think of the guys on the beat. Yeah. You know, with the hat on, walking through town, telling you to yeah. pick your litter up and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, now, I looked awful with that on. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> 10 years in the police force. Talk yeah. to me about, like, <clears throat> the progress of kind of where you started and where you ended up in terms of what you were doing job-wise. I'm yeah. guessing you had to start off as a PCSO. Was that a thing when you started? No, no. You started as a... Well, I, so uh, what was I? Because when I, I inquired about it years ago when I was young. Right. 
because okay. I thought well, the armed police looks quite fun. Yeah, you know, drive around in X fives with some guns yeah. and that. But they um, in the era that I looked into it, you had to start off as a PCSO in your town. Is that right? And I was like, oh, like yeah, uh, you know the the, the free all your cops. mates seeing you walking down. Yeah, yeah, and you ain't even got any power, right? You just like the geezer <laughs> saying, "Pick your chewing gum up, or I'm going to grass you up." Like, yeah, <laughs> that's going to stop me. <laughs> so I was just like, mm, maybe not for me. I get it. I get it. Yeah. No, for me, uh, yeah, you didn't. Ha- you have to do uh, eighteen months on a B. Yeah, okay. You had to do a minimum of that, and that included your initial training. Um, so you're in uniform, first 18, and after then you can apply for more specialized roles. Okay. Yeah, certainly. So I was, I did about, oh, I did my 18 months, and then I went straight onto a beat team. So a beat team was you get a geographical area, which basically you manage as best you can, developing community police relationships, mm-hmm. dealing with the more protracted, longer term, lower level crime. Okay. Yeah. This is a job that most people at my age, after a year, 18 months would go, no, thanks. That's where you go to retire. Got you. But that wasn't my thinking. I, when I went on there, it was like, I get a chance every day to go and speak to and find out everything that's happening in this yeah. area. And because of that, that harnessed my skill set in a certain way. Mm. And people start to earn your trust and you earn theirs. And they start to give you some information. And it builds like this. And so because of that, what would be the graveyard units of the police to me was where I learned, where I cut my teeth Mm -hmm. and learned my trade. Um, and that led inevitably from that point to, um, going into the covert intelligence world of, um, basically recruiting, uh, informants Mm -hmm. or as the Northerners say, grasses, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, and managing those over protracted periods and the police, and this is no secret, the police have specialized units who do that, who are specifically trained. So I did that for a, for a period of time, um, Within that, and I'm just thinking what, like the the natural thing mm-hmm. to what happened probably probably next really because there's so, this obviously sidelines. I I was doing uh, sort of force administrator for for cyber crime as well. So that again was um, certain covert methodologies are used by law enforcement agencies and other agencies to um, investigate organized yeah. crime. And so I was dealing with with that. And then also uh, th- I was given the force lead uh, to oversee human trafficking cases. Mm-hmm. So the connection there was, and I remember this now. So without giving anything too much away, <laughs> I went to meet someone, a lady, and they I went there expecting her to talk about her bloke okay Mm -hmm. um and if you're a big time crook don't piss your wife off (laughs) all right that's a moral there as well or don't tell him everything don't tell him everything so anyway expecting her to to talk about her old man uh in what he was doing anyway she proceeded to talk about um something that just blew my mind how they met how she'd been moved from one country to another how she'd been sexually abused, how she'd been put in what would essentially be a brothel. Mm-hmm. And and I was just listening to this. I can remember going, what on earth is this? Uh, I've never really heard about this before. you know. And you might hear about that now, but back then when I was at that stage of my career, it was quite an unknown, okay? So then I'm looking at this and researching it and da, 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 and I've got this thing that pops up that goes human trafficking. What the hell? This is like, you, what? You know, you hear about these things. And then I sort of looked into it more and I looked up what specific, there was no modern slavery act in the UK at that point. Mm-hmm. There was a separate law here. There's a coroner's and justice act for forced labor or something. And then there was this act for this about child sex exploitation, but there was no dedicated thing. So then I just basically dove into it. And at the time, I was doing my master's in international criminal justice. And I was looking for a thesis idea. 
and so I thought this is great. Um, and I love a master's that to do. Mate, I really enjoyed it. Did you? <laughs> and <laughs> that probably helps to get through it. <laughs> well, it helped a bit. And um, yeah, yeah. So I'm, <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you're doing a masters at the same time as this. I can remember there were dark days. You know, you're saying British miserable weather, like on a laptop for, God, was, right? Never, never again. I'm glad I did it, but never again. Anyway, mm. sideline. And um, so I chose to do it on trafficking of Nigerian females under the influence of witchcraft. Wow. And if you say that now, again, even now. You say that, go, well, what on earth? What you, you're just making this crap up, Tony. What are you talking about? But I interviewed the British detectives who dealt with three cases in the UK at that time. One, the first in Europe, European case, one, the first in the UK, and another guy. And um, so these women in Nigeria, uh, in a, certain areas, are then uh, transported, trafficked into the UK, through UK and transit over to mostly Italy for where they're sex, uh, for on-street prostitution. Prior to that, they get taken to a shrine. A juju priest invokes the spirit world, cuts them across their arms, across their breast, puts the blood into a little pot, locks the ladies in a coffin overnight with the pots, invokes the spirits, the ladies, when they get out, they have to promise, swear an oath that they will not talk to police. They will repay any debts to their traffickers and so on. And they are psychologically and religiously bound to this oath. So how does that practically implicate? What's the practical implications of investigating that for cops in the UK? Well, first thing is awareness. Don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. How are we going to identify them? They're not going to come up and say, I'm a victim. It doesn't work like that. How are they going to deal with um, trying to interview this person? Well, they can't interview them because they can't tell us because the spirits are going to enter their dreams at night. How are we going to put in witness protection measures? Well, we can't because these spirits come through walls. And so this is what these cops had to deal with. And this was mind-blowing to me at the time to try and come up with a best practice of how to investigate in the UK – how to investigate victims who had undergone juju rituals. Right. What? So, And that's just Did one thing. That's just one MO, one modus operandi of one country, of one religious practice, mm -hmm. of one ethnicity. You translate it across the world and you start to see how complicated and diverse an issue this is. Mate, I've got so many questions, but do you believe in that? Did I believe in the spirits? Yeah. It's irrelevant. They did. They did. They, did they? they did. And they do. They have this dualistic relationship, basically. With, with they, have, they believe in God as a supreme being, mm -hmm. okay? But they also have these demigods, spirits that walk around us. And they're voodoo there, just like... Of... Exactly. So when you and I say voodoo, or when we say it in a Western context, everyone just a raised eyebrow probably laughs and goes, get back to the 18th century. Mm -hmm. The reality is, this is very much on the forefront of many, many countries, particularly North Africa, East Africa, West Africa, these traditional practices are throughout everything that they do. You'll get cops in Nigeria who will spray to, pray to the spirit world and go to a shrine to get an oath of protection before they go and deal with a bank robbery. That's the reality of how mm -hmm. it works there. Um, and that's just there. You know, you'll go to it's, Uganda. It's, well, it's, go on. it's quite interesting, that stuff, because... There's an element of religion does that as well. It's a type of religion, I guess, all that voodoo spirit stuff as well. It's a belief, it? yeah. It's a belief system. It's a faith. <clears throat> but it gives people unwavering confidence and power, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, if we, even if we look at modern, whether it's terrorism or, or, or crime or, or some of these people, the reason they feel so confident, the reason they, they don't really even care about dying or afraid of dying is because they've been blessed by yeah. the powers that be. That's it. So That's it's it. like their right to, to go down that road and yeah. and, and do it for them. And you've hit the, hit the nail on the head there. It's one you mentioned about power. You know, as an individual, if you feel infused with the power of God, mm -hmm. you know, what, what what are the limits as to what you can do? Well, what are the limits? In their eyes, There's right? nothing. So then as a practitioner, investigator from, from this angle, how do you do, deal with that? How do you identify it? How do you prevent it? When it happens, how do you 
investigate it. You know, those kind of things. It makes it very, very complicated because they're not individuals that were, that are have a belief system within our true understanding. You know? well, your values are different, right? You're running yeah. on a complete different set of values. Exactly, yeah. And how do you find a common communication method with these with these yeah. people you know yeah i mean slightly different not not to that extreme but even seeing a differences in cultures right so i was born in turkey i came to england when i was two years old for a better life yeah um and i've been blessed to live here and have an incredible life yeah you know compared to if i look at some of the family that we left behind in those in those regions but yeah culturally even they have these differences yeah Massively. and i see that you know i've grown up in in a mixture of cultures you know, our background, our heritage is Turkish, Kurdish, Armenian, and Sicilian. Wow. So I'm a mongrel. Wow. And I've grown up in England. Mate, that's, so, that's a great mix. <laughs> that's a great mix. Speak a few languages. like So Yeah. So I'm like, you know, I, I go back home, or not back home, home is here, but I go to Turkey to see my grandma, let's say. Yeah. And she'll talk in a certain way, and she'll bless me with Allah and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, and which then is I'll beautiful. Be, yeah, and then yeah. I'll be here, and I was going to Sunday school because my best mate was Christian-American that had yeah. moved over from America to teach. So yeah. I had this real mix of kind of cultures and religions, and yeah. I tried to take the best of it all, if you know what I mean, yeah. what I felt was the best well, that's it. I mean, my values. I can see your face light up when you're talking about it. It's like the richness of diversity, isn't it? I mean, when you say these things, that sounds great. You get the, the, to dip into so many different worlds and cultures. And I love that. I actually it, love it. It made me a bit of a chameleon growing up. Like I could, I could fit in with the underworld and speak their lingo and dress like them. Yeah. I could fit in with the directors of the world. I could fit in with the tweed wearing, welly wearing shooters yeah. of the world. You know, like all the different kind yeah. of cultures and stuff. Dip in. Yeah, Dip in and I'm out. very much a people person like you. Yeah. But Tony, I was going to ask something. It's probably a, a question you're <clears throat> sick of hearing, but for the guests and people that don't know, what is modern slavery? And what separates it from our traditional concept of what slavery is? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question, really. I Modern slavery is an umbrella term. Okay. So when we think of slavery, like the old chattel slavery, okay. So we think about um, people of color being taken from the Africas over to Americas, okay, during the transatlantic slave trade. They'd be locked in chains, be locked on boats, and they would be transported and, and forced by threat of penalty, menace, death to, uh, to work in one capacity or another for another, yeah, to be owned, mm -hmm. okay. So that's what we think about then. And during that time, for example, there was about, I think, recorded around 12 million, okay? Actually recorded has been taken from the Africas to the Americas. Wow. In the context of today, the latest figures by um, International Organization on Migration, uh, United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime and others is 50 million. So there's 50 million people globally now held in what is called modern slavery. So when we come back to modern slavery, it's human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So when someone is recruited okay they are transported okay so when i say recruited what i mean there is they are deceived coerced threatened kidnapped those kind of things okay taken to a place so physical movement which doesn't have to be international it can be from county to county it can be you know um in order to exploit them and the nature of that exploitation is non-exhaustive but generally what we'll look at are things like sexually sexually exploited forced labor labor servitude slavery and organ harvesting or trafficking so those are the things that we will generally see and then there are many different types so in the uk for example what we see a lot of is trafficking for criminal exploitation so for example in the uk uh, figures at the end of 2022 was about 17,000 identified victims of of modern slavery in the uk the dark figure is around 136,000 that we think at any one point in the UK alone is held under modern slavery. So wow. when we look at criminal exploitation, what we'll often find is young men, if not girls, but mostly young men who are acting as drug mules, criminal gangs are making them do that. They're going on the trains county to county. Um, that kind of thing we'll see a lot of with British nationals, young men. When it comes to girls, we'll generally see young girls aged 13 to 16, again, who will be trafficked in one way or another for sexual exploitation. Um, and then it depends on generally um, the nationality. And what I mean by that is those that are trafficked from a certain country, nationality-wise, we will see Vietnamese traffic mostly for criminal exploitation for the, for the huge-scale cannabis grows that we see across the UK, Albanian women, 
the traffic of sexual exploitation, none of which are many a surprise. The Eritreans we get a lot of now. So the most identified victim of human trafficking for many years in the UK are UK nationals. They were number one. Wow. Young British boys and girls being trafficked for those purposes and others. Second mostly was Albanian, and I think third was Vietnamese, and maybe those two swore around. It's swapped now. They've got Eritreans, Albanians, um, and now I think English, uh, British, sorry, a third. Yeah. And that changes a lot. The, the British one really surprises me. Yeah. Like I get with the elbows and stuff because you see a lot of it and yeah. you hear a lot of you it. You hear it. And yeah. And it feels very prominent at the moment. But the British, I can't get over those numbers either. So in the slave trade era that we all kind of hear about in history that mm. is appalling, which was appalling, we're talking about 12 million recorded. Yeah. Obviously, recording was a bit shitter then than it is now. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. now we're talking potentially 50 million. That's right. Yeah. But it just under our noses in a different way. How, how does it work in terms of, you know, the human trafficking thing you talk about? If I've come to you as a human trafficker and paid you to bring me here, that doesn't fall under modern slavery, does it? Oh, right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I think you're looking at smuggling. People smuggling? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. So but the human trafficking term for the public doesn't necessarily yeah, mean you're what right. you're thinking. It, you're it right. tends to mean the geezers on the boats trying to get over here for yeah. a better life. Yeah. So and that's not forced, is it? That's them asking. That's, that's right. Different. Yeah, Am I right yeah, in thinking no, that? And it's a really good good thing to mention, Ty. It's, it's good to untangle the two, human trafficking, people smuggling. So human trafficking is when someone is coerced, they're deceived. They don't know what the true going. nature of what's going to happen to them at point B, country B, whatever that might be. Smuggling is different. Smuggling is a contract, okay? Mm -hmm. You take, I'm going to give you something, money or otherwise, forget from point A to point B internationally. Got okay. You. At the end of that, when, when someone reaches point B, the transaction is completed, it's done, there's no exploitation, that's it. What we will sometimes find is the two will converge. So I will pay you to take me to here, to get me across. However, actually what happens is I'm the smuggler, but I have a deal with the person who picks you up at the end. Got you. Now, you could argue, was that always human trafficking? Because... Actually, it wasn't a smuggler. The intention was there. But you see how the two converge. So when you see people coming on over on the boats, um, which is a term that is really I really hate now, when I hear that term coming over on the boats, it just triggers me because mm. I see, I meet these people. We, we work with these people who've gone on immense journeys, and I mean immense. You know, we I worked in Somalia for a year, and I worked with those guys down there. And you talk to them before they go on these journeys. They call it the talib, the walk, the journey. When they leave, they are going to for a better life and to remit the money back to family, those kind of things. And along that journey, particularly through Africa, but also through the Middle East as well, they are kidnapped, they are raped. They are hung upside down. They have bottles burnt on their backs. And they are video recorded being raped by other men. And these are sent back to their parents as ransoms. This is the reality of what happens to a lot of them that go through those routes. Now, when we say people on the boats coming from Calais, it consists of people like that who are lucky enough to have got there. But then it also contains a criminal element. So when people come over on these boats, inevitably, politically, we will hear about those few who cause trouble when they get here. And that infuriates me because the vast majority are escaping lives that perhaps not you or I, but many others just do not appreciate what's happened to these people and where they're coming from. And it's it's sad. It's sad to see politicians use that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And um to an element of, as I said earlier, I came when I was two years old. I don't know what method or how or how not, but if you speak to my mum and dad, have, go and have a coffee with them, they will tell you exactly the same. They were Kurdish Turks living in Turkey when you weren't allowed to be Kurdish during that that kind of era. Yeah. So they've run away. You know, they've both got 15 brothers and sisters each, had a horrendous life. Mm. They've taken their only child and gone, let's go and live a better life. Yeah. Now, the risks they've had to take to get here and yeah. when you get here, they've got no support network, don't speak the language, have no money. And some of the stories mum and dad tells me, it honestly breaks me up like yeah. hearing it. Which it's is probably one of the reasons now I'm, I'm kind of trying to work so hard to be able to give back to them. Yeah, yeah. Because they've risked everything, if you know what I mean, for me to live it's well. It's huge, isn't it? It's yeah. huge. And 
you, 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 it's very hard to get certain things unless you've experienced it, know someone who has, or working in those sectors. It's very, very difficult. It's very easy. You'll know better than me. Sat on your sofa, pointing fingers. You know, we do it all the time. You watch SAS yeah. Who Dares Wins on television. You're like, fucking pussy. I'd have done that. <laughs> but it's easy to say that. Sat on your sofa, your cup of tea and your hobnobs. Yeah, Go and do it then. We all see <laughs> things through our own lens, on our own experiences. And if the narrative, if your narrative is limited to what you see on TV, what you watch on the BBC or CNN or whatever, your idea of migration is a load of people of colour sat inside an overcrowded rubber dinghy in the middle of an ocean. That's migration to you. The reality is very different for those individuals who are on that boat and the journey they've got to. If I hear about them coming over, it almost, across the channel, it almost gives me a sense of satisfaction because those are the ones that have made it that far. You know, it's it gets to me. It's an emotional thing mm. for me. But yeah, So, so you know. also like you... The, the general, the, the vast general public will use that term or think the way you've just explained because that's what we're programmed to do. That's it. If every day you turn the television on and there's a certain narrative yep. in the media of what these people are or aren't yep. or how they're referred to, you know, there was a period when they were referred to as cockroaches, which is a mandate to be able to kill them. You yes. know, there's all these kind of, you know, when humans are no longer humans, that's a mandate to be able to kill them when you refer to them as something else. So a lot of this stuff, as angry as it makes me or doesn't make me, Sometimes, and it's not an excuse, but if people don't have the knowledge, they they probably need the knowledge before we can kind of. That's right. We don't know do, what we do don't. You know what I mean? Yeah. We don't know That's what we it. don't know to an extent. Yeah. And I'm not saying ignorance is you know is a way out of it, but you know you might want to learn, you might not want to learn. Like I've got loads of friends that are vegan. I'm not vegan. When they send me these programs like What the Health and all this stuff, I refuse to watch them. Yeah. Because I know I have a heart. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I know morally my compass is very correct, and yeah. I know that if I watch that program, I'm not going to be able to eat that oh, that's burger again. And so I I yeah. purposely choose to be ignorant, and I'm saying that openly now. Yeah, I choose to be ignorant on that front. Well, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> because I just know if I watch that program, I'm never going to be able to eat that yeah. that bacon sandwich again. Yeah. Because if I could understand how deeply pigs feel and don't feel, do you understand what I mean? <laughs> Mate, I'm going to call, call you every listen. week now and say, have you watched it? Have you watched One it? of my mates keeps sending me videos. <laughs> he was sending me videos on uh, Instagram like in the mornings at 6am. I'd wake up and there'd be an inbox from him of a slaughterhouse. I sent him oh. a voice note saying, mate, send me a video like again. I'm going to fucking block you. <laughs> He was like, yeah, but mate, you need to be more self-aware. You know, like giving me all yeah. the spiritual like, stuff. I get it. Oh, I was yeah. like, I understand. I don't want to see oh. it because I want to go and have my breakfast. What yeah. am I going to eat now? Lettuce. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But, this, <laughs> but he's very clever because he's planted the seed now. That's it. And that's going to do, subconsciously, that's going to dwell in there somewhere. Yeah. I mean, listen, mate, I'm all for self-development <laughs> and all that stuff. I, <laughs> I said the same thing to him. I said, listen, for a decade, you were a shit house, yeah. And now all of a sudden you, you're turning to me to, to preach all that, that for that whole decade i was it. saying to you mate that's not very good what you're doing yeah. it's not very nice it's affecting the lives of the future it's affecting this fitness what are you telling me oh, it's just business it's this it's that when so people get preachy that's that's yes. when it gets annoying the mandating it? of it's, things i struggle it's the opposite with. impact the opposite effect yeah why why the flight on modern slavery like why is it so important to you that particular subject i think out of everything that's going on yeah. that you could potentially help fix why that one does it mean that much to you do you know i think that that strength and conviction in, in dealing with that stuff has grown over time i think um the more you sort of get into this kind of world of dealing with human trafficking i dealt with a lot of crimes as a cop i was a detective um dealing with all sorts of things and you will see and hear things you know and uh, dealing with that but there's there's few things in my early police career that have impacted me as much as dealing with this now. When I was in uniform, I remember we went through the door of a couple that were arguing. They were um, habitual drug users. They were intoxicated and fighting. And on the floor, there was a baby surrounded by um, heroin needles. I picked the baby up, heroin needle in its foot, pulled the heroin needle out and just got on with the day. Holding the baby, make sure it's okay. A couple of years later, came back to me, dreaming about it, couldn't get rid of it, really had this deep impact in me, okay? I had to delve into that and, and got help and that was fine, but it's something that I just didn't realize. 
that was one occasion of something that just got me. I don't know why. This other stuff gets me constantly. And not to the degree where it's keeping me up at night and those things, but I'm every day hearing and seeing new and more horrible ways that people treat each other and do things. Some of the cases we deal with now, you know, particularly with with different countries, is just the stuff, you know, particularly with the children. That's really, really tough. Um, when we look at, uh, and again, different cultures and practices, we've, you know, I've got people I work alongside with who deal, you know, they deal specifically with child sacrifice. So they're trying to stop children being sacrificed. I want to say sacrifice, and I'll, and I'll be blunt and, and talk about it openly now um, and edit as you will, but, you know, the children are, are taken, they're kidnapped off the streets and because the their blood is valuable. So, again, spirit world in, in another country where I work in regularly, um, one of the, a lot of the cases we get are a case of child trafficking for sacrifice. So people will... They'll chop the heads off the kids. They'll chop their limbs off. They turn the kids upside down and they put the blood over the land before a building's built because that brings good fortune for the person who owns the hotel. And the parent, the father, whoever, is given a job at the hotel. So that's the exchange that goes on there. So it shows like the level that life is worth in that particular area, um, the practices that go on. And then I work with some people, well, how do we deal with this? And an organization that deals with this on a daily basis, so I have the you know, very great fortune to work with on occasions because they're just amazing people. They deal with it the best way they can. So what they do with the young kids, what they do is they go around and, and pierce their ears. So why do you pierce their ears? So because that draws their blood, so it's not as valuable anymore. So it chances are they don't take those children. So those cases are, are regular. It's not like it's happening now and again. They, they're daily cases. And then you've got cases where we've got... Um, organ trafficking. I mean, that's just massive. It's big in Turkey. You know, well, it's yeah. massive. And, and I, you know, a, might know a lot, a lot about it. But this is like the ultimate supply and demand kind of business model, where those with those with the money, but are either aging out or particular you know, kidney. We see a lot of, you know, are pro have people proactively in countries that are less fortunate, identifying those that either have the right blood types or otherwise, and moving large groups en masse to other countries where they're going under the, uh, to port to work in a, as a maid, in a restaurant, whatever it might be, they get there and then within 24 hours um, they are drugged, wake up in a makeshift hospital and they've got a, a scar across there their abdomen you know those kind of things and when we're we're trying to repatriate these people back into the particular countries and and trying to deal with that and um you know those sort of things ha happening every day so when we talk about why do i stay in it why do i why is it a thing for me i've never dealt with anything like this and i'd be very surprised if there was something that would have a similar impact i've worked alongside the ct world you know, that is, sorry, counterterrorism world and stuff like that. And, you know, we get a lot of people now that more and more so they're being trafficked for the purpose of committing terrorist acts. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets gray. Are you a victim? Are you a, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but again, it's it's about, for me, that the kid, we can have some great results of preventing what I consider the worst thing that could happen. That stuff makes my blood boil. The The... I've got nothing against faith, nothing against religion, nothing against voodoo, nothing against do what you want. But when it becomes a, a belief like that, yep. that you need to kill a person, put their blood on the soil before you build for good foundations of a good faith, yep. the fuck comes up with this stuff? Mate. But that's been around for centuries, you know. But this, a lot of it is actually old tradition, isn't it, that hasn't died out in some of these countries? Well, we call it old. We call it old. It's not old. It's very. It's contemporary. It's it's not changed for some countries. So we refer to it in our sort of mentality and country and upbringing and da 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 as old. We're talking about you know people being burnt as witches back in whenever. Well, yet yeah, that's a long time ago. But the reality is that's never really changed. It's it's as new as it ever was in some countries. Got you. Yeah. 
Yeah, the organ thing as well. I remember being, I think the first time I went back to Turkey was 2000. I was born in 1988. I came here when I was nine, in 1990. So I was 12 years old. Yeah. I remember. And we actually drove over, for, you know, through Europe and, and drove yeah. back. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I remember vividly my auntie had a, um, like a WH Smith style shop selling pencil cases and whatever. Yeah. In a little area that my parents grew up, which wasn't very nice in Istanbul. And I remember going out like across the road to get a, a loaf of bread or something. And my dad would be like, be very careful, son. Be very careful all the time. Be like, what of dad? He's like, oh, they kidnap kids here for organs. I remember he was 12 years old. He was like, be careful yeah. because some rich family will need a kidney for their kid. And you'll be just be floating along and they'll take you. And if you're lucky, they'll take the kidney and leave you alone. If you're yeah. not, if you're you know, not as fortunate, they'll, they'll kill you for it. Yeah, yeah. And I remember being 12 years old thinking like, bear in mind, like I, we moved to... London first. We did live in a shit area of London, so we could afford. We lived in a, on a road called Murder Mile. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a <all>. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, all around that kind of Hackney and Haringey, Green Lanes, yeah. Yeah. all those areas. And then we moved down to Swanage, yeah. believe it or not, because my dad wanted to Well, what a transition. Yeah, That's somewhere really nice for me to live. Yeah, so as you can imagine, I'm, I'm kind of 10 years old living in Swanage. And dad's still under this mentality. He's ex-military in Turkey anyway. He's gone, He's like telling me, son, don't walk the same way to school twice. Don't sit with your back against the window. Don't, yeah. you know, from a very young age, I've been groomed like this effectively, yeah. which is very, very good. I'm very streetwise and it's helped me loads in life later in life. But at the but, time I'm thinking, well, what the fuck are you yeah, talking about, dad? We're in Swanage. Who's going who's gonna to come and get me? <laughs> that old lady with a bag only, of chips. Yeah. <laughs> There's only one road in and out of Swanage anyway. <laughs> but it's only when I went to Turkey at 12, 13 years old and saw kind of the gun crime, saw the extortion, you know, all the racketeering, all the organ crime, all the like crime that I could only imagine in films that was happening. Yeah. yeah. I was like, fuck, okay, it makes sense why he is the way he is, why he's so kind of aware. Yeah. You see what I mean? Because yeah, a lot of yeah. us in the West, we living in the cloud, mate. We're in a bubble, we're walking around. I was having this conversation this morning at the coffee shop yeah. when someone was moaning um, about the kind of knife crime in, in Bournemouth and, and whatever and, and yeah. you know, and not that I'm being insensitive to it, but really, compared to other places in England, we're still living in one of the safest areas. We've still got a blue flag. We've got a purple flag here in the yeah, area. Yeah. And then if we go to other countries, fucking, it's like heaven here. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, in in not yeah. that it doesn't make our yeah. issue an issue, but yeah. like, just you have to take some perspective, don't you? That's right. Well, it's like we're Context. saying before. It's like like you guys were saying. You know, when you step outside the box of the normal frame of of reality to different countries and whatever it might be. And you see, you have the ability to step back and see a different perspective. And once you see it, you can't go back to mm -hmm. just having this, this particular view, can you? And so it just opens your mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all that you've explained explains why mm -hmm. you do what you do. I mean, nearly a decade in the police force, right? I guess you only did 18 months on the beat as such. Yeah. But you were a detective for a while after. Yeah. Now, what do you think then to now is the biggest change you've noticed in, in just general crime. Oof. Would you agree with the, the rise of knife crime since your era to now? The rise in knife crime. Or do you think it's reported more? Yeah. And what I mean by that is, just so I can explain for anyone listening, is I feel like in the old days, we didn't report when it was gang on gang as much. Mm. So there's, there's you know, when my whenever my wife sees something on television, she's like, oh my God, there's been another stabbing in Bournemouth, there's been another, I'm not going into town centre. Mm. And I'd be like, babe, these things are largely isolated between gangs, county lines, drugs, money, whatever it might be. It's not that you were walking down the street and someone's walked past a machete and cut your arm off. Yeah. Like that stuff does happen, but yeah. it's one in a whatever million. Yeah. You know, it's generally an attack on someone known to the other person. Yeah. And I feel like a decade ago, less of that was reported in your everyday news. Mm. Social media was smaller as well, right? So yeah, you just had true. news at six o'clock. You'd yeah. put it on and someone had died in a road accident and, you know, and you didn't really hear about the crime stuff. Whereas yeah. I feel like now, I don't know whether they're reporting more, but every single incident that's probably was always happening is now being reported. That's and the general public are fucking terrified, yeah. if I'm honest. Yeah. Absolutely but, terrified. You know, I'll, I'll probably have to be honest first. Most of my footprint work now is outside of the UK. So the knife thing is not on the agenda really in, in my world. But I do certainly recall, you know, when I was a cop, we, I mean, that's like, 
eight years ago I left, and then I did ten years before that. So let's let's for argument's sake say twelve, thirteen years ago. Um, you know, knife crime became at least for a, for a matter of months, if not a year or two, of being the hot agenda. Because I recall there was a manufacturing company, a clothing company, that put a, a knife inside one of their clothing things. Do you remember which one that is? Can you remember that? Was it Stone Island? No, I might be no. too old. Wait, I'll show my is age. Is it Stone Island? No, it can't be. They put something I just in, thought yeah. of Stony and straight it was away. this outrage <laughs> of this crime. So suddenly, you know, every teenager is now going to go out and stab someone. Suddenly, because the implement is there, mm. that suddenly that changes the acceptance and people were just going to go out and go crazy. And I think the real, the real and I use that just to draw on uh, to answer the question is, really, it doesn't really matter what the statistics say. If people hear about it, if people buy into the single narrative, if people get scared, if they get scared to leave their house, to walk past a group of young people, to go down a certain street, really, it doesn't matter what the true statistics are. I'm talking about possession or otherwise, right? Yeah. It's impacting people's lives in a negative way. Mm -hmm. My mum has a police recorded message come through her phone every morning to say what crimes happened in her area every day. You can imagine. She's 75 years old. Literally, do that. the world is ending, you know, because what's his name got robbed and da da da. Because you've got this coming in all the time, it just it's self fulfilling. You, it's prophecy, exactly. Man. You're just scared of everything. So, right, is are there more? I don't know the statistics. Are there more people by absolute number or proportion of population? I'd probably look at the statistics in that way. Okay. Are we genuinely seeing? And by absolute number, more possessional stabbings. If we are, I don't think that's really reflective and we can draw too much from that. If it's by proportion we're seeing a lot more, then maybe we have to start thinking about different ways of dealing with it or changing the ways we have. Criminalizing something does not stop it. It doesn't stop human trafficking. It doesn't stop murder. It doesn't stop you know, theft. It doesn't stop... The reality is how, how do we deal with that? And this is... And I want, if you can correct me, Ty, if I'm wrong. When I think of knife crime, I think gang related. So do knife I. crime. So do I. Yeah. You know, murder, well, by knife, well, I don't think that is, I don't think of it as that. So let's talk about gun. So what are we doing? And I know we've done a lot as a society and otherwise and individuals to tackle gang violence. Well, is it that we ban knives? Or do we, we ban the thing that is used at the end? Or do we go back to working with these young people and trying to understand why that, that, that gang has developed, why it's come to the point where one person has to stab someone who's walking down the street in order to prove themselves to join that gang? Those are the real crooks of, I think, prevention. Mm -hmm. um, I've probably taken it off in my own direction there, Ty. No, no, I have, it's, but no, it's, it's perfect. It's, it's always nice to hear an opinion of someone professional that's worked in those kind of fields. I guess my thoughts are, I mean, to, I'll give you an example. So I, eight years ago, seven years ago, was the first time I ever went to Dubai mm. with my wife. And we've left a restaurant, a bar, a club with friends, and we're walking back to our hotel and it's 2.30 in the morning. And we're walking where Dubai Marina is now. Mm. And there's, and I don't mean this to offend anyone, but there's a couple of uh, supercars parked up and a big group of gentlemen dressed in a certain manner, chains, watches, sat on a bonnet, listened to a certain genre of music. Mm. And I'm walking with my wife, just me and my wife. And the first thing I did, because I, I forgot I was in Dubai, is I moved her from my left to my right, this side, the guys are on my left. Mm. And I said to her, if anything happens, run as quick as you can to the hotel. Because all I can think of is being in the UK. Yeah. And in the UK, in London, at two in the morning, if I was walking past, I'll tell you how it's going to go. I'm going to walk past them. I've got a nice watch on. So she, she's got some jewellery on her, wedding rings and stuff. Mm. They're either going to say something to her. Yeah. I'm going to retaliate. Retaliate, yeah. And they're going to shoo me in yeah. or stab me. Or they're going to try and take our watches and I'm going to retaliate. Yeah. Or we're both going to try and run, or I'm going to try and barrier it so she can get away at least. Yeah. And I walked past them. Do you know what happened? Nothing. They didn't even look at me because I forgot I was in Dubai. There's very little crime, or literally no yeah. crime. And I walked past it and I thought, fucking hell. 
like my heart rate was going, you know, I'm, you're literally yeah. fight or flight mode. I'm thinking, right, here we go. In my head, I'm preparing. I'm preparing. I say, look, go that way. Go through there. The hotel's just here. Yeah. You, you're two minutes. Just sprint as fast as you can. Don't look back. So is that <laughs> as a result of you've been attacked before? Or is this a combination of what your dad taught you, what you've seen on TV, what you've been surrounded in, and that, that security conscious sort of it's, thing, it's is a, it? It's a little bit of both. So yeah. it's everything my dad's taught me. It's previous experiences of being robbed at home with knives and being out and about. Go. It's previous yeah. experiences of hanging around with those people myself when I was a little bit younger and understanding yeah. how they work. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little bit of everything put together. Yeah. And then it's my natural kind of instinct of I'm quite a traditional man and I like to provide and protect yeah. for those around me, not necessarily just my wife, could be my male friends, female friends, you know, yeah. no, no discrimination there, yeah. but for everyone. Um, and the reason why I've given a story is my thought on the whole knife crime thing is there's two angles we'll need to go short term and long term to fix something right okay in the short term this is all my opinion in the short term to fix a knife issue we need more police presence we need much tougher punishments in the short term okay because let me give you an example if you as a, a guy that was sentenced last week a week before it was in a paper for for stabbing a lady and killing her locally he got three and a half years. He'd be out in 18 months, first time he's committed a crime. That guy is going to be out in 18 months. And the knife he used, if I showed you a photo, it's like something out of fucking Zelda. It's not like your kitchen knife that he's gone out with. It's yeah. a full-on, like, zombie fucking... <laughs> like, who's even selling this shit to yeah. this kid? But anyway... I need to see this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll show you after. So short term, I think, police presence, much, much tougher punishments because... Mm. If you are caught <coughs> carrying a knife mm. and you know it's a flat five years in jail, no ifs, buts, or maybes, no half sentence on good behavior, yeah. it will eventually, five years for possession, 10 years for using, life for murder with no exceptions. Yeah, It might take six months, but it will get through to the people a little bit more, I think. Okay, And I'm not on about the serious organized crime guys. They'll always be using yeah, knives because yeah, that's different. Yeah. I'm on about the kids that think it's cool to carry, mm. then end up in a position that they're accidentally using it or it's being used on themselves, their own knife, Yeah, because they're not from that world. Yeah, yeah. And then my second train of thought is exactly what you said, the heart of the issue, mm. probably education, opportunities, yeah. you know, communities. We'd probably have to go right back to the age of two and seven yeah. Look at what these people are growing up in, what they're experiencing. How can we intervene? When can we intervene? Is our, is our education system doing enough? Yeah. Probably not. It's a little bit outdated. You know, all these kind of things working together. And then, and I mean this again. I like this little smile you do if, as your mind's working about yeah, the next thing. Like, oh, I don't know. I don't <laughs> know I can, do, oh, it, yeah. do it. Do like it. Over 10,000 people a week listen to this. And I'm thinking like, <laughs> fuck. What can I say? I don't want to, you know, oh. but, but so then, then I have the opposite, the thought sometimes of, you know, you've spent 15 years of your life battling the war on crime in some way, shape or form. And I'm talking about how we can fix knife crime, how we can fix whatever, but do the powers that be want it fixed? Oh, now we're getting deep. But do you understand what I mean? Like, do the powers that be want it fixed? And what I mean by that is I'm going to flip it a little bit off topic to, let's say, we, everyone argues about cancer, right? Mm -hmm. That could we have found a cure, but have we not found a cure? It's a multi-billion pound industry. So mm -hmm. drugs, crime, war, mm -hmm. terror, you know, all these things that are infesting our fucking communities and fucking them. Mm -hmm. Do we want to fix them? If we fix them, do we lose a load of income? Not as just England, but internationally. Yeah, Money makes the world go round, as you know. Politics, sure. agenda, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Is it deeper than us? You know, you're going to give your life to this cause, as is your colleagues. I'm mm. going to give my life to my causes that I mm. believe in, whether yeah. that's the fight for mental health, whether that's the fight for this, but are we fighting an uphill battle? Are we ever going to win? Yeah, but, I mean, from my point of view, I'll probably answer the last question first, is, you know, I never expect to win the battle. You know, I I just I've taken the mantle on from who those that came before me. Got you. Try my best with all of the others to keep the balance. Mm -hmm. And then I now work and train those who are going to carry that on in one capacity or the other. I'll come in, I'll do my bit for as long as I can. Um, what's success? Well, success is that, you know, as much as we could have done, we've rescued these people, we've stopped this from happening, and so on. 
going back to your original point, I think about the security thing, I think, and this is real cognitive dissonance stuff, is that actually, statistically speaking, we've probably never had a safer planet. You go back to the Middle Ages, you go back to all these sort of things. You can, you didn't have a home, you know, and you'd walk down the street and you'd be stabbed as soon as you looked at someone. So in our lifetime, what we will inevitably do is relate it to when we, when I was young and all those sorts of things. Now, the reality is, and I'm sure this is the case, Ty, for you now, is you can walk down the street without really giving two thoughts, leaving this building, to be able to walk down the street, go and buy yourself a vegan pasty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get in your car. Your car's going to be secure. You're going to drive, pick up your wife, go for a nice meal, yeah. and so on, you know. Um, so you are one of the fortunate top percentiles of this planet. Completely. In reality. Yeah. In reality. And so am I. I wouldn't disagree with that. And so are many, many people who aren't rich, but we have the ability to walk out and be safe. I'm fine. And to try and get a job, to try and get educated and those things. We are so lucky. And I'm just drawing back on mm. you know, the things from, from you mentioned. In this country, we are so lucky. Very. Your parents for tooth and nail to make that journey to get here. How lucky are we? Mm -hmm. So when I hear my mum talk about <laughs> how bad things are, when I hear this general narrative of it's, you know, knife crime, and I'm not taking anything away from it, what you're saying there, but to me, I'm like, relatively speaking, we've got it bloody good here. Really, really good. Agreed. Um, that's my long-winded, waffled response. And then if if we want to go deeper still... Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> if we want to go deeper still, like, in a hundred years, mm. you'll be dead. I'll be dead. No, I'm getting crying younger. <laughs> I've decided. Everyone we know now will be dead. Yeah. And no one alive will know you, will mm. know anything about you, will know your name or anything. Yeah. And it's only a hundred years I'm talking about. But if, but to give you an example, if you said, no, no, people would know me. Do you know your grandparents' grandparents? Even know their names? Mate, no one will know me tomorrow. But this, this, is, what, this is what I'm getting at. <laughs> so actually, if we want to go deeper and zoom out far enough. Does it really it matter? None of it fucking matters. No, there we go. But That's as humans, it. we feel that the All work dust. we're doing now is so fucking important yeah. that it needs, you know, like it, we're the most important. And I'm, for, I'm sure Marcus Aurelius felt that thousands of years ago. Yeah. And we keep reading his meditations every morning, or I do, <laughs> you know, how to live better and be more stoic and fucking yeah, yeah, yeah. all that jazz. Yeah. So actually, if you well, think about reality, it. Well, that's reality. His does. His voice does echo. His is. Time. His is, yeah. He's written a book yeah, about yeah, it. And yeah, some yeah. people's do, but yeah, yeah. the vast majority just disappear you. into the universe and they're just a statistic. Yeah. Mate, we're born. I'm going to go even deeper, Di. Go on. Let's we'll see what else. So my theory of the universe, okay, is you are one of the most amazing things that could ever possibly exist, all right? And so am I, and so is your wife, and so is it, and everyone who's ever existed. Because how much sperm didn't get a chance to swim around and get where it should do? How many people could have been born other than Ty? Ty's the one who got a chance. 400 trillion to one. Was it that? It is. Mate, and so you came out there, and you know what? I'm even a makes, good swimmer as a What makes you even more luckier is that nine, you managed to make it nine months in your mummy's tummy. Yeah. And even more amazing, you get to come out and take a breath. You got to, like, live. Yeah. And then those that took two breaths and three breaths and so on. And you've managed to get to a ripe old age of 35. I mean, that's a... If that's not a miracle, I don't know what it is. How special is that? It you is know? special. It's special. So what do you take from that? If you believe in God or otherwise, what do you take from that if that's the foundation? Is it, it doesn't matter, I can do what I want because no one will ever remember me, and da, da, da. or is it actually, I've never existed before, I got the chance, I'm just going to find something that keeps me out of trouble and hopefully I'll get something out of, make mum and dad proud. And mm. I guess that's it. I don't, I don't know how complicated it needs to be. Sometimes. No, you're right. You're right. And I saw a, a little TikTok clip the other day of an actor. I think it was Brad Pitt or someone saying, like, what matters? Uh, we don't know if what ma what we do matters in the end. Like, really, truly, once they're gone. But that's it. 
who you spent it with, I guess, matters the most. But Yeah, it kept us busy. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking really busy by the sounds of you. Okay, so let's let's move on a little bit. So you, you set up a consultancy, what's it called? Illustro. Illustro, I couldn't remember yeah. how to pronounce it. That's in it. 2017. So That's right. prior to that, you were employed, is that right? So I left the police about eight years ago and Where had this now? crazy idea. Yeah, okay. Yeah. To, um, so basically I was in the cops. Yeah. Okay? Uh, I was a detective. Um, I was get, uh, doing my exams for promotion. The career was set. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to do this. Inevitably. I want to do things. I want to travel more. I want to, you know, that. And my partner at the time was a part time scuba diving instructor. And she wanted to leave her job. So we said, I tell you what, why don't we do this? Whoever gets a job first in another country, we're just going to go there. Sick idea. And lucky for me, she was a scuba diving instructor. So she got a job in St. Martin in the Caribbean. And we went over there for two years. So the first week, I was bored out my mind. Yeah. Absolutely bored out my mind. So I <laughs> I took a speedboat over to uh, Anguilla, Anguilla, however you want to pronounce it from where you're from. Yeah, because <laughs> um, the uh, the commissioner there was an ex British cop, and I went over and said, "Hello, my name's Tony. This is my background. Can I help with anything?" And they went, "Oh, oh, hang on. We we don't have any covert training. We don't have training in in this and this." I went, "Oh, I could do that. They'll give me something to do." I said, "Oh, okay. Sounds great. Tell us what you need, and that was it." Well, I need a. I'm good. We're, this is going to be practical. So I need a speedboat, um, yeah. <laughs> and we need authority to go onto this island of this part of it, and we need to have access to a prison, and we need access to a really nice hotel, um, because I wanted to write this huge training scenario, um, and it was just amazing fun, absolutely amazing fun. I was. We had cops. You know, we had different agencies. I wrote a training manual for it, you know, cut my teeth doing that. And I found myself really enjoying training. I just found my my thing, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and then that went really well. And that was doing the, the sneaky beaky stuff and then asked me to come back and train their detectives to develop their professional... In the UK? Uh, no, in oh, the yeah. Caribbean, yeah. So we were doing doing all sorts there for a couple of years. Um, so I registered a company because we were still in part of the EU then. Because uh, St. Martin, where we were staying, was Dutch and French. So I registered St. Martin, France. yeah, it's here. Yeah. Established um, the first work and social responsibility program for youth offenders in oh, St. Martin. Oh, God, that was insane, yeah. So I, Dutch <laughs> island. I went to, I went to, so my landlady, I went, went and met, just had a chat with her, a cup of coffee or something, you know, an islander. And uh I said, oh, this is my background. And she was the head of the social services on the island. She said, why don't you go and speak to this organization? Because, again, I was bored and I wanted something. Else. And so I went and met this organization <laughs> on the first day. And they dealt with all the foster kids on the island. Okay. And when we call foster kids, you know, in the UK, it's a foster system, isn't it? Theirs is very informal. They've got two big houses with nice families who let people drop off their kids when they've got drug issues, whatever it might be. That's how it works there. So there's no formalized system. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I go and meet this organization, and it's Christmas Day when I go to meet them in this big hallway full of 500 kids and their parents. Some have been, you know, on social services equivalent, da da da, da. Um, And I'm the only white guy. And this bears relevance, okay? So then the lady who runs the organization goes, you look like Santa Claus. Can you be Santa? <laughs> <laughs> so like... Hands me a beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm just sort of sat there and I've just got these, you know, island kids coming and looking at me like, what on earth is happening? This is a real Santa. Um, you know, yes. and that kind of thing. And <laughs> and I think the organization then saw, you know, I, the sense of humor and and uh, and that kind of stuff. And it just went from there. Anyway, so long story short, um, I know that the foster care system needed some help. There was a prison on the island for youths um, with no system for when they got out. So I designed a system, got the funding from uh, the Dutch collaborative called the Salmon Work in Defonsen. They gave us uh, 100 grand, and I did that project as well. Wow. So uh, it was to create a system for those coming out of prison on the island. And then again, it was just another thing, a string to the bow, really. Tony, um, why did you become 
like an independent consultant and what do you feel you could do as a kind of private citizen in that space that you couldn't do in the police? Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Or is it just the, the money? And the reason I ask that is yeah. I get asked a lot to, to join kind of boards of stuff or even um, a couple of times they've asked me to, to become a councillor in the area and, yeah. and you know, or, or join these boards and whatever. And I always say, I feel like I can make more change as a private individual with money out yeah. on the outside without the red tape shit you've got yeah, in there. You're right. You're right. Mate, I, th I think certainly you don't have the, the boundaries that are put in place by an organisation, the red tape as such. So for my consultancy, I make a decision about what I think is ethically and morally and business. That, that, that's the circumference. That's the, you know, uh, of how I make those decisions. And that can be, we will work with this company um, because we generally work with large supply chain companies about forced labor. But also on the side, we do lots of school workshops for free in Nigeria, Serbia, Kenya, UK, when we talk about human trafficking and online safety. So because I hold the purse strings as such, I can make those decisions yeah. and it's my baby. When I'm a consultant, again, we're not talking about the level of being employed as a cop, but it's, it's a middle ground because I'm going in, the client, the UN, whatever agency it might be, says, I need you to go to country X and do this. This is, this is the bigger picture. You're the consultant. We'll leave it to you how you do it, but that's that's the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll let them know what I need and da da da. da. So, I I found a good balance in my life and in, in work that gives me the satisfaction of being able to do what directly I want to do in my company. And in the grey, when I work for the international organisations. But certainly a hell of a lot more freedom than yeah. than being a cop. And better paid, I, I, you have to admit, probably. Well, it may be just a little bit. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit. Well, anything consultant um, is like add a zero on. <laughs> I'm a consultant sometimes, you know, for hospitality, for events and stuff. Yeah. Because no one knows what the fuck you actually do. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, I need 20 hours to do this. To do what? Well, don't worry. Just to do my consultancy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I think those, those of us that have gone on from being in the cops or, or the agencies or whatever it might be, is when you find yourself as independent, you're starting from scratch in many ways. Yeah. You've got a whole skill set and it's not like you can often walk into the door as a consultant because you're setting yourself up. If you're getting employed again, that's fine. You've probably done the negotiations before you've left your job or retired and, and it's there and you're walking into it. You've got to build a reputation when it comes to consultancy mm -hmm. and you're only as good as your last job. So... I've managed to stay to to stay in with the UN and others because every time I go in, I go, right, I'm building on what I did before. I'm going in with the same passion, the same motivation, the same goals as I've always held. And that hasn't changed over time. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not worn me down. It's not not as sexy or as exciting anymore. You're going in to do a job. And I think I think if consultants in general have that passion and motivation, particularly in, in the fields that you know I, I work in, you've got to have that. The yeah. moment you don't, it's exit time. You've had enough. That's it. Um, Makes sense. If that answers the question, yeah. No, it does. There's something I wanted to touch on here quickly. Um, in 2018, you, was, you were included in the global top 100 corporate social responsibility influencers list and what nominated. It's long, isn't it? Yeah, and nominated as a UK top 100 modern slavery influencer. Yeah. Now, what an interesting place to use the word influencer. Because when I think of influence, I think of Love Island. I encourage it. No, I was, what, what? No, I was 99 in the Love Island one. <laughs> <laughs> like, why? What? When they say influencer in that context. Yeah. I think they mean it with a literal meaning that you're influencing for I'm good. I'm encouraging it. Yes. <laughs> um, I think just uh, there's, there's numerous people in this space who try, are trying to or have done put their head above the parapet. Yeah. A lot of the stuff we do, the public will never, ever hear about. Um, and, you know, like, you, like you're aware that the podcast I'm sort of launching as well, the guests that I've got on there are – you know, my close friends who work in that space and they do far more amazing things than I could ever dream of, the kind of things that they've done. And I want I want to start building 
a public awareness, not around just this, but around the people who are doing these amazing things. Yeah. Um, because we just don't hear about it. So, you know, this sort of influencer kind of thing that um, I got and, and, and things like that, it's just about, I think I'm, I'm the... Not the first one, but I'm one of the first to try and in this space about human trafficking to put the head above it. Public, to go public. To go public. And then hopefully that will encourage others to start realizing, actually, I have been indoctrinated into having to keep everything in my life a secret. Every, all my work, mm. I can't talk to my family about it. I can't talk to my friends about it. Some people don't even know what I do for a living. Now- You look like a salesman. I'm in the position. <laughs> well, I told you how my hair cut yesterday. <laughs> now I'm in a position. I would say now me, I, you know, generically is you're not in that position anymore. It's okay to show how good you are at what you've done. And you've done some amazing things and people deserve to hear about this. I think it's really important because for the public to even understand what's going on, like a lot of people listening to this, Mm. Won't even know half of that stuff you said about modern slavery. Yeah, yeah. It's it's honestly incredible. Mm. Um, I want to touch on another area that you work on. Uh, dark web cryptocurrency cases. It says mm. here. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, can we overlay some music? On? <laughs> we'll make it look good. Don't <laughs> worry. Yeah. So two two elements to that. First part is cryptocurrency. Um, obviously, it's a real recent development. There's no real regulation. Mm. Um, what kind of crimes are you seeing in that space? I know the crimes that I might have heard of in that space, but yeah. like, is there anything in that space that we might not know of that's going on beside your usual <coughs> kind of scam or, or using crypto to pay for things that yeah you don't yeah. want tracked? It's probably a good point to start there really about, it's interesting you said that comment, it's a new thing. And I think, you know, it, it is a new thing for for many people, but I think, it's important now for the world to realize that crypto is here. It's very much here. It's been around for a long time and is now in many, many societies as, as the normal financial transactions that are being used. You go to the US, there's, there's crypto ATMs. You know, you can exchange wherever you'd like. Um, crypto has got a bad name because of initially fluctuations in price, okay, or in value. So it's a very... You know, it's unstable. Unstable. Thank you. Um, I've lost a bit on it as well. I've, I've won a bit and lost a bit. There you go. Oh, you're dabbling, you? you're dabbling. Only like a little bit Mate, in the old it. days. Why not? Why not? <laughs> not um, anymore. Yeah. So you've got that aspect of it, but it is in many countries now regulated. And you've got countries that are now establishing their own cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. So you'll not only have a British pound that really, if you think about it, a British pound doesn't exist. It's a human concept. We give a piece of metal value. When we go and withdraw money with our bank cards or whatever, we pay with a little tap on the thing. What's happening? Well, one computer's saying, knock some money off of this, this number. Let's reduce it a bit in this central number. And that's all it is. It's just a figment of our imagination. Yeah. And, and crypto is very much around that as well. I mean, it's obviously a little bit more complicated. It's got a bad name because we always link it, or it historically has been linked to the dark net. Okay. The dark net is an amazing place. Okay. It's easily accessed. It's a tour network, the onion router to get onto dark web. And there's many, many things on that that you will see on the normal clear net. Okay. So I'll probably, I can see the confusion in your, in your eyes, Ty. So I'll step back a bit. When we think of the internet, we think of um, the clear net, the surface web. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we, go through our browser and we type into Google or whatever it might be, um, you know, a search engine, you yeah. know, we find things and they're indexed, you know, so we'll go on and the first page, second page of Google results and we'll click on it and that's how it's worked. It's indexed. A long time ago, or not that long ago, the CIA wished to develop a system of exchanging information. Okay. And this is where the birth of the dark web came. Okay. Um, and rather than securing it to the peer-to-peer -peer encryption between to exchange information within the CIA, what they did is they opened it up to the world. So then suddenly the world has access and can traffic information across, which hides then the exchange of information from agencies and, and other things. So if you look at if you think of the 
you know, the whole of the internet as a as a glacier, really. You can see the surface web just poking up on top. Below the ocean, that's the majority. You know, you're talking 90, 98%, if not more, is deep web in scale. How many people do you think are using the dark web? Oh, it's it, it, be impossible to say. Impossible to say. But generally speaking, it's knowledge and access. So are you do you have the Tor network downloaded? That's how you access it, TOR. You can go online, it's open source. Do you have that? Brilliant. So you've got the the web. You can go on there. Do you have internet connectivity that's reasonably well? Because things could tend to be a bit slower on the deep web. And that's it. You're in. You're good. How to track a num the numbers again is just something that's that's next to impossible. The part of it that I kind of we're talking about offline. There's a lot of bad stuff on there as well, right? There's a lot of bad stuff on there. There's a lot of bad stuff on the clear net, on the surface web. Yeah, yeah. There is, but there isn't on the clear web. If I type in a clear web that I want to buy a nine millimeter Glock, yeah, I can't. Oh, you're on the wrong site, mate. I'll show you. <laughs> no, I hear what you're saying. So, what? Like, or if I want to buy your <laughs> logins for Facebook, yeah. or or a load of logins to create some yeah. scam, yeah. do some fraud. So, what would I think? It's could maybe like the. Vo like the terms we use. So if we go surface web, Google, da, yeah. da, 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 you go underneath that, you've got deep web. And let's call that everything else. Okay. The dark net is what we would refer to as an area of the deep web. We say area. This is just for visualization. Yeah, 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 yeah. Part of the deep web that uh, is used by those who wish to commit criminal acts got or you. that tend to be criminal acts. You will find uh, websites on there that are just like Amazon, just like whatever, okay? You will go on there if you want to buy drugs. So you'll set up a profile. You will um, go online. You'll pick your drugs. You'll have that sent to wherever, and it's a drug market. Same thing happens for illegal firearms um, and many other things. What we will do get a lot is um, platforms that are used, dark rooms that are used for the exchange of uh, child sexual explicit material, uh, child abuse forums where those that wish to uh, abuse children will uh, congregate and discuss ways of um, avoiding law enforcement, what they're going to do, and and to sell children, to sell unborn children, um, and all the other horrendous, horrific things that, that they're going to do. Um, so you do get that on there, but you also get that to a degree, on closed doors within the surface net as Got well. You. Yeah, it's you need a key to get in to the deep web, and the key is the Tor network. You need to find the lock with the key <laughs> Got you. to okay. get into the deep okay. side of things. Okay, and that's where you'll have generally in law enforcement you have you calls. You'll have trained undercover online investigators. And I'm not giving away secrets here, who are trained to either purport to be an adult or a child in order to engage. I mean, how careful do we need to be on the normal web in terms of like, you know, putting passwords on your Facebooks, your Instagrams, your emails? Most people use the same fucking password for everything, don't they? From yeah. Like, Tie 69. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> like, we have to be a little bit careful, right? Yeah, very much so. I think um, you know if you're not from a cybersecurity perspective. Cybersecurity, yeah. I mean, certainly. I mean, you've you've got to be able. To, it's so difficult, isn't it? You know, you. But you've got to. If you're not already, you must be using a gener a password generator, and you've got to have some level of. You know, it can't be something that is so memorable that anyone could pick it. And I know that makes it more difficult. But you've also got to have a, a safe location to store these passwords. This is the issue. Um, and you've got all of these kind of things going on. The reality is, Ty, is that if I or any other person wish to target Ty, they will, and they'll get stuff. That's the reality. I've had it done to me. There we go. Identity fraud. They took 10 phone contracts Policies. out in my name. Right. No, but like, okay. so I don't know where they got my stuff from, right. but I'm guessing they would have bought it from So the online. chances are they, were, they may have been targeting you. Yeah. Maybe. Probably. Or it could have been and which we see a lot of, is more sort of programs or others that cast the net, and they will try and pick up different things, and it, 
you know, it comes together. But but linked to that and the human trafficking side of things, you know, you get your emails come through, send me Bitcoin. Yeah. I, we've got your dick pic. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, a thing that came out in June two th- of this of last year, 2023, is the slavery compounds. Now, I don't know if you've heard about this, but Interpol, for the first time ever in June 2023, issued a, a global orange alert for an imminent threat of trafficking into what we call scamming compounds. Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, and there's more and more popping up around the world. 3,000, the biggest one is 7,000 people being held within buildings, in locked buildings, chained to the floor, zapped with um, cattle prods, sat at a computer, scamming the world. And these are all being wow. found. So one of the ladies who I work with, Mina Chang, who's an amazing uh, lady, Thai lady, she was one of the first and her organization to identify this. Um, and yeah, I, I won't go into the details with, with the stuff that she does, but it, it's just amazing. And now they have videos. We have videos now or even that have been posted online of what's happening inside these places. And a couple of the big, bigger bosses have started to be brought down now. But it's just phenomenal. So when you're getting these things, I'm not saying it is from people in these compounds, but scamming now, identity theft, identity fraud, is an international business. It's not the random guy sat in Nigeria, you know, that we tend to sort of stereotype as this thing. It's not. It's highly, highly organized. Wow. It's like a call center then. There you go. Exactly like that. But forced. Yeah. That falls yeah. back under your human trafficking That's thing, it. doesn't it? And then people get told, well, let's go there because you've got a job or you're going to uh, get an education. They yeah. get there, get locked away, and they're gone. Was there something you mentioned earlier that you want to talk about with the kids? Are you doing something? What are you up to now? What's What's the future hold for you? Future. Uh, the, the kids stuff um, inevitably comes up in whatever I do. With the human trafficking side. So what I will do, I will, generally speaking, it's two hats. There's a lustro and then there's the the consulting, the international stuff. So I will go in and I will help a country to, uh, a country's human trafficking, people smuggling units to investigate those crimes. Mm -hmm. And inevitably that will involve children. Adults as well, men and women, but then children. So I deal, deal with a lot of that side of stuff. The other stuff um with lustro is the school workshops and we do that for free because i am all about prevention when a child when someone gets abused that will impact not only them for the rest of their lives but their children and their children's children and children's children. generational trauma that's it intergenerational trauma we see it through what happened with chattel slavery mm-hmm. inherited trauma we see it through every aspect of trauma that isn't dealt with yeah and we certainly see that abuser abused becomes abuser and a whole host of other issues anyway so prevention so what we're doing we're going into schools um and we are basically saying the issues of human trafficking how to stay safe the stranger danger kind of thing the youngest we're doing the youngest we've done is four-year-olds bearing in mind you've got to be 13 to be online have an account Four-year-olds. Four-year-olds. Do they understand what you're teaching? school in the UK, and oh my goodness, they are, you wouldn't believe it. Well, what we don't go in and say, this is human trafficking. The UN says this is the, it's not like that. We sit them down and we talk to them generally about that gut feeling. And you get that from a very early age. That feeling that I don't like what's happening. Something is wrong. So who do I tell? And that's it. Who do I tell? That autonomy of, even at that age, of, underst- of n- understanding of feeling and then telling a teacher, telling whoever it might be, someone close they know. And then as they go, we, we teach basically age level. So, you know, when we're looking at the teenagers, most of them are online well before 13. They'll have a Facebook account, Instagram, whatever it might be, even though that, you know, they shouldn't. Um, and every time we do these, oh, yeah, I got a DM from this person. Yeah, he sent me a, a dick pic and da 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 da. And these these are children. It's like ten mm. year olds, eleven mm. year olds, um, and some of them have that that robustness already. 
inbuilt with them. They they know, and some of them laugh it off, and their ten year olds, oh yes, yeah, yeah. and others don't have that, and many don't, and they will get suckered into it. AI is a massive thing at the moment. We're seeing more and more profiles that are developed in AI. So a trafficker or groomer will use AI to produce an image of a child, good-looking young man, good-looking young girl, and then will try and interact with those profiles that match their sexual preference. They will then earn their trust, move them onto a more encrypted platform, WhatsApp or otherwise, exchange of images, right? As soon as that child sends that intimate image of them with no clothes on or whatever it is, boom, they've got them, right? You either keep sending me these pictures, you either touch yourself or do particular acts, and worst case scenario is that you will meet me at a location or I will tell your parents, I will put this online. And that's when the physical abuse can start. So we, the two, we're seeing a lot more recruited online and then abused in real life. So that's what we talk about. And that's and that's what we're seeing. So to prevent that from happening, we try and get in there as young as possible. Doing you, God's work, mate. You and I remember Not strange Not I believe danger. in God, but you know what I mean. <laughs> you and I probably remember Stranger Danger. Yeah, yeah, that was our era. Same thing, online. And it's just empowering these kids. Empowering kids, it's, it, and, and it's, it's not putting the onus on kids. They shouldn't have to do anything practical to prevent it. But like you and I got taught by our parents, Ty, is be security conscious, be aware. These things exist. If we don't talk about them to our children, all we're doing is creating that, I know it's all, uh, naiv naivety? Naive, yeah. naive, is that a word? Naivety, yeah. Um, where someone who is clever enough purports to be someone nice, offers you something lovely, a better life abroad, uh, whatever it might be, it's not because they like you. It's because they want something from you. And you need to have that skill set in life, irrespective of whether it's abuse or, or whatever. You need to have that. Because as those people, and as you know, Ty, will take advantage. Yeah. It's, it's sad that we have to do that, but this is the real world, isn't it? It's a reality. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you one question before the end. You've obviously seen some mad shit. You, you know, some of this is very traumatic to, to people listening, let alone people that have experienced it and lived it. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that in yourself? How do you deal with that in your head? Yeah. Um, Are you okay with it all? I've dealt with it in different ways over time. I think you, it normalizes. It normalizes, and it's important to recognize that as well of, of seeing certain things. I've, when I was in the job, when I was in the, as a cop, um, doing the use, doing the um, covert stuff, you had to see um, a mental health professional. There was no ums and ahs about it. You had to see a psycho um, psychiatrist to make sure that you were coping because you mm -hmm. can't talk about it to anyone else. When you step out of that, that, that comfort of the organization, you're on your own. And if you don't manage your mental health in those periods, no one else will. So I, I found very early on, I found someone who had the security clearance that I could talk about what was going on to an extent yeah, um, and who had worked with military before and others um, and talk about those kind of things. And so talking about it is 100%. I've got certain people within my circle of trust who – I go to as well. I talk to them about it and it vice versa like you have with your mates. You know, you have that that thing. And I've also had to, I've become more introspective as, as I've got older to understand why I think the way I do, why I act the way I do, whatever it might be. And being able to have that mindfulness, that awareness of, Thoughts aren't feelings. Feelings aren't thoughts. To take a breath, to mm. to deal with that, and make sure that there's that the time away from the work. You have to have the time away. A very good friend of mine, um, who is like the the person who's is my hero that deals with with the children's stuff. Um, he had you know in his career and and those that still do deal with that field have to regular basis watch videos of children, young babies being abused. And he described it as corrosive. It's corrosive. 
to the mental health of any human being mm. other than those that find that. So if you don't recognize it, if you don't deal with it, if you don't take that time to, to really understand the impact that it's having, then you're going to go downhill. So really, there's no choice. If you want longevity in this career to deal with this stuff, you can't ignore the mental health. Yeah. And that's it. I only ask that because, as I said earlier, I'm an ambassador for Dorset Mind, local yeah. mental health charity here. Amazing was So I do a lot of work with them in fundraising. And I've also realized myself through some experience that after a while of seeing something, you do become desensitized to it, which is probably what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. But because you're desensitized to it, you think it's not having an effect, don't you? Mm. <clears throat> and in three years, five years, a decade, you have a full-on fucking breakdown. Yeah. And you can't understand why. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't picture, but you can't put mm. it back. Where, what was the path there? Yeah. No, it sounds like, like you're on top of that, which is important. Well, like everyone, we're all trying. We're yeah. trying, aren't we? It's, it's difficult sometimes. but Mate, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate the work you do. That means a lot. Because Pleasure, one day buddy. I'm going to bring kids to this world as well. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Ty.